Let's learn Minuet 3. Let me just play it to you first of all. One, two, three. The interesting thing about this piece is that it was originally for keyboard and we find it in the Anna Magdalena second notebook and it's not actually by Bach it's by Christian Petzold but he had heard this piece and obviously notated it and then put it into this lovely little notebook of piano pieces. There's a bass line to it then the left hand of the piano and this bass line is very important in Baroque times the bass line or the harmony was the primary focus, not the melody as it is nowadays. In the 20th century, the violin started to become this homophonic, single line, singing instrument, usually accompanied by a piano. But back in Baroque times, they had a completely different view of instruments like the violin or all the stringed instruments. And so the violin was actually a contrapuntal speaking instrument. So this melody is a text a musical text and you could apply words to it you can make up your own words I'm gonna have a go right now and make up some words for the beginning of it so I could sing I love to play the violin I love to try and make it sing I love to play it I love to play it let's play together now so singing the melody is a good thing because it shows you where the cadences or the breathing parts are in a natural way. These cadences are particularly interesting because they're like questions. You've, you've got a question which will lead to a different direction or, that you take in your life. Should I do this or should I do that? Um, the other aspect of this piece is that it modulates. That means it goes to a different key. So. It's a journey, it's a musical journey, and the harmony is the thing that's taking us on this musical journey. So in this instance, it goes to the fifth degree of the scale. So if I'm in G major, which is the home key, and we call it the tonic, so we have G, A, B, C, D. So we go to D major, and you might notice that if you look at the music, that you'll start to see C sharps appearing in the music. So what does this actually mean? Well, it varies from piece to piece, and this is your interpretation of it. If you think of G major as being, let's say, like your house, like your home, and let's say that you're thinking of your home as being a safe 
warm, comfortable place, then there's the mood or the emotion or the energy of that first phrase. And we're in that tonic key. But it modulates to the dominant. Now that's a little bit like going from your home to school. Now, school can be a fantastic place. It's where your friends are. So you can have a great time with your friends and you can have a really fantastic day, which excites you. And when you go back home, you tell your mum all about what was going on. It could also be a day of some trials. You might have done a test and you might not have done as well as you had hoped in that test. So you might feel a bit blue about the whole thing. So the dom can also have a little bit of drama involved in it. Um, you might have a fallout with one of your friends or a reconciliation with one of your friends. It can go either way. So we go to this place of drama, which is the dominant, and then we need to come back from that place back home. So we've left school, but this time we say to ourselves, well, I'm not going to take the usual route back home. I'm going to take a slightly different journey back home. And that's the musical journey that this piece is trying to describe. So I'm going to play you the bass line. Try and hear this, and you could try and sing along to it. The interesting thing is that when we're playing this bass line, eventually what we want is to hear the bass line as we play the melody. So we have something like this. If I play the bass line and try and sing the melody, it's not easy, but uh, it would go like this. La, 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 And the difference is that as it modulates into a different key, it creates a different sound world in the melody. So we have to create a different sound. Now, you might think, well, you know, I think that my home is nice and warm and comfortable. But it's not always like that. And there's also different degrees of comfort. So you might say, oh, I feel happy. Well, what does that actually mean? Is that mild contentment or is that ecstasy? It depends on the degree and it's the, the, the degree is created by your bow. It's the curve that you put into the bow stroke and the speed of the bow that you're using. The speed of the bow makes the string vibrate. The curve gives it the intensity that you desire. So you can vary that as you're playing. So what you don't want to have is the phrases sounding exactly the same. You don't want to hear Because it's dull, it's boring. It has to have shape. The shape actually in this one is interesting because the first bar leads to the second bar, the third bar leads to the fourth bar, almost like a decoration. So I'm going to make a crescendo, but the first one I'm going to play warmly. Now the next one I could play a little bit less. almost like a reminiscence. It doesn't have to be that way. It could do the opposite. It's up to you to decide how you want to interpret this piece. So if I play this um, bass line to you and you can hear how it fits, so it goes, I'm gonna do it without the repeats. One, two, three. One, two, three. So there's a bass line for you and it's actually quite fun. 
as you um, develop your skills on the violin, maybe you'll play the piano as well, so you'll understand how to read the bass clef. It's important to learn the bass clef, but this is your chance to be the cellist in your group. And so you can play on the violin the bass line, reading the bass clef as I was doing just now. So let's look at the piece as a whole. It, there's a lot of scales in this piece, a lot of G major scales and a few D major scales. We're going to look at the scale patterns, but before we do that, there's another feature which is interesting, and it's a decoration. And it's a decoration which we call an achiacatura, or crushed note. In Scots, we call it a Scotch snap. And it's in bar eight, and it sounds like this. And the interesting thing about it is it's a very quick little note which we squash into the main note. What we're trying to avoid happening is that the bow does what the left hand finger does. So we're trying to avoid, because then I run out of bow. So the bow does a very slow motion, whereas the left hand does a very quick motion like this. One, two, three. It's a very sort of elegant and charming little decoration, this one. So I could use that decoration and come up with a warm-up for this piece, which is a G major scale using achiacaturas. So it would sound like this, three on the D string. One, two, three. Now, achiacatura one open. Two, three, two, one. Two, three, two. Two, four, three. One open. Low two, one, and then the two. So there's an Akiaka G major scale. There's other things that you could do. There is bowings in here with slurs and things like that. So um, the last two bars go. So you could just do the bowing going. We've already come across that bowing before. And actually, in this particular piece, the, because the keys are the same, there's one bit that is exactly the same as in Minuet 2, which is low 2 on the E, 3 on the D. That figure, the octave figure, where we use the impulse of the down bow to get us over the strings. And then the other figure that's the same as that, but with different notes, is a perfect fifth, and it's three on the A going to three on the D string. So it goes three on the A, three on D. So those are those two figures. Let's have a look at the scale patterns, though, that exist in this piece. And sometimes what I like to do is just put a square with a pencil in the music so I see where they all are. Um, it's nice to spot where the notes are going up in these steps. So the first one's in bar one, and it's three on the D string, and it's a scale that goes up to three on the A. So three on the D. And the rhythm is T, 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 ta. The next one is in bar three, which starts low two on the A string and goes up to low two on the E string. The next one is in bar five, and it's a downward scale, which is going, I put a one, three block down on the A, and it's three, low two, one, open, and then I go back to one. So three on the A string. Then the next one is low two on the A, going down to high two on the D string. The third line is the same as the first line, so I then skip down to the fourth line. It starts very similar to the second line, so it's one and three down on the A, and I'm going all the way down to um, open A, and then I'm going back to one. So three on the A, now we've got a slight difference. This one's low two on the A, back to A. And then the last one is one on the A going down to uh, a high two on the D and then back up to three on the D. And then I'm going to look at, so those are some of the scale patterns there. 
I'm going to look at the longer scale patterns, which happen in the third last line. And I have to think about finger patterns here. So the finger pattern is that on the A string. And then when I go to the E string, it's that. So I just play open A, one, high two, three, open, one, low two. So I'm just going to play that scale again in rhythm. So T, 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 ta, ready, go. Now, we can look at things from many different perspectives. There's a scale in the last line that starts on the D string, but it uses exactly the same finger pattern, but on the D string. So I'm going to play that now. So open D. So I have these two scale patterns. Now I can extend that slightly by doing the little tail that happens after I reach the top, where it goes then down, then down. And on the the D string start one, it starts low two on the A, one, open. So we've got this beautiful curve that goes up and then comes down again. So the first one on the A string. And then the one that starts on the D string, go. So I've just played a load of the scales with separate bows. They're not marked with separate bows, they have a slur. But once I've got the notes really confident, so I might spend two or three days just doing those scales, that's all I would do on this piece. The next stage is to add the slur. Now the slur always starts with a push bow, so it's starting from your yellow sticker or above the red sticker and you're pushing towards the heel. So it goes, the first one is three on the D, slur, separate bows. Next one, low two on the A. Slur, separate bows. And if I looked at the two longer scales that I played near the end there, um, the first one starting on the A string, I slur the first two notes. Slur, separate, separate, long bows. Now, and I'll do the same on the D string. Slur, separate, And you might notice that within this bar, there's always this hierarchy where the first beat of the bar is the important one. And it's almost like a zigzag bow. So when I'm reaching this top note, I'm going more bow, less bow, least bow. And that's an important feature, this sort of phrasing off or melting away of through the bar, because it's going to come in later pieces as well. So we've looked at all the different scalic passages. Now we're going to look at some of the features of it. And I'm going to start with the second last line, a line that goes like this. It's, it's a beautiful line because it shows you the dance. It shows you the dance movements. I know you can't see my feet, but first note is the step, little step, big step, little steps. OK, and so here's what it sounds like. Three on the A, three D. One and four on the A, three D. So that's what it sounds like with all the decorative notes. Let's play just the raw melody first of all, so we can hear what it is. It's a simple melody, but it's a beautiful melody. And it goes like this. It's three on the A, one, two, three, four. Then three, low two, one, A. So again, we have this elegant, charming curve pattern. So I'll just play it again. So three on the A, one, two, three, four, two, three, three, low two, one, A. Now, with that in mind, I'm going to add the decoration. And the decoration is an interesting one because it's three, two, three on the D string for the first two bars. So I have three on the A, now three, two, three on the D. 
then four on the A, three, two, three on the D. Then one, three block, low two, one. And this is a more intricate decoration. You slur the first two notes, A to three on the D. Two, three, open A. And when we have a slur which is crossing over the strings, I do like to, first of all, stop slurs. A, stop in the middle, three on the D, then separate bow. So I'll do that a couple of times, so stop slurs. And what I'm making sure is that my finger is down before my bow plays on the D string. So the left hand has to move in advance of the bow. It's always going fingers, bow, go. So now I'm going to try it smooth. So we can build that line up just as a separate entity. Then I'm going to go back in the piece and I'm actually going to look at an example of what we call a sequence. And that comes in the fourth line of the piece. Um, in bar terms, I think it's bar number 13. Uh, and this is what it sounds like. So it's low two on the A. And then the fourth line one, which would go... So, sorry, I played the second line and then I played the fourth line. These are two sequences. Um, it's basically the same material, but it's a step down from one another. Sequences are like the petals of a flower. They make up a unique flower. You can tell that they're from the same flower or what that flower is, whether it's a rose or a dandelion or whatever. But every single petal is unique. So again, if I take the fourth line this time, I'm not going to play each phrase the same. I'm not going to go... Because nothing in nature is the same, and that is boring. So think about what the harmony is saying, and which harmony interests you the most. Which one gives you a little, um, makes the hair on your neck stand up a little bit. So the first one, if I give more on the first one, then less on this one, then more on this one, then less. So, do I like it? Not, not necessarily. I think what I'm going to do is less, more, and then less. So this time I'm going to go less on this. You can come up with your own solution, but what's important is it doesn't sound the same. One is different from another. Remember, the oak, oak leaf is different. It could be green, one could be brown, one could be big, one could be small, one could be more jagged, one could be smoother, but they are recognizably from the oak tree. Every sequence is unique. Each one is unique and you've got to make it sound different. The other interesting feature of this is with the slur her separate pattern, the separate notes are the steps or the movement of the dancer and they're light and they're delicate. So I'm trying not to make them smooth but rather, I'm trying to get lightness into those steps uh, so that I'm imitating what the dancer's feet would be doing on the floor. So let's have a look at this piece. We've looked at the scale patterns. The next stage is to add the first note of each bar. So the first bar is going to be three on the A, then you hop three over to D string three. So it's three on the A. Now slur three going up the slur scale. The next one is I put one and four down on the A string. Now I go back to low two on the A. Then I put one and low two down on the A. Here's 
the Aki Akatura two, three, and I lift and round with the bow, a nice circle bow. Then I do the same as the first line, three on the A, hop the three over to the D string, slur going up. One four block. One with low two block. So we've arrived in G major. Right, now we go off on our journey. So the next bit after the repeat is I put one on the E with four on the E. So I'm using the one as a kind of anchor for that four. So one's down and four's down. Now I play low two on the E. Three, four, two, three. Hop the three over to the A. Low two on the E string. So when I did that, I had done one on the E, three goes over on its own, and the one is still down on the E string, so that's where I know where to put my low two on the E. It goes right beside that one. Then both fingers lift off. Then high two, so I put the two right beside the three. So this is another sequence, and it's interesting with the shapes because the scale passages are not just going linear in a line. They go linear, and then there's a skip at the end of them, a skip down. So the first one is low two on the E. Now that's all in skip, um, that's in steps. And here's my skip from four to two. Then I go three on the A, and I go up in steps. And I skip to the three on the A, up in steps, and I skip to three on the A. It's quite tricky, that one. It reminds me of the tricky bars in Perpetual Motion, which have that little skipping movement as well. However, what I would do is have a game, have um, your cards, because this is all on the A and the E string, so you have a card that says A, a card that says E, in between you have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 in the correct finger patterns, and what you're going to do is you're going to jump to the numbers that you're needing to play, so if you're 4 on the E, and you're going to play 4 on the E, 2 on the E, 3, 4, 2. That's one way, just physically moving is a really important thing. The more that you can use your feet, the more that you can use your mouth when you're trying to learn something, then the better it is for your learning of it. So the other way is um, to say the numbers out loud and try and visualize what you're playing. So you say four, two, three, four, two. And then you look at the next one, three, three, E, one, three. And I'm thinking and imagining myself actually playing and moving from string to string. The next thing that you could do is actually just do the bowing on its own. So the first bar of the fifth line goes E, 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 E. The next bar goes E, A, E, E, A, E, 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 A, 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 A. It's really important to separate the hands so that your right hand knows what it's doing, your left hand knows what it's doing, and then when you bring them together, it will sound incredible. So we've reached our big scale that's going up. So we've done this one before, so it's open A. Now, it has a particular ending, and that's what we've got to learn. And we can use our techniques for learning. Say the, the notes, say the fingerings, jump the fingerings on a plan on your floor. But the first one, so when we start on the A string, it goes one on the E, open A, high two, and three. So one of the games I like to play is I'll play the first phrase. So I'll play this. And 
and then pupil will play the next bit. Now, I'm going to skip down to the last line. If I did it on the other scale, it's... But this time the ending's different. It goes 1-3 on the A, then hop the 3 over to the D string, high 2. So, without telling your pupil, choose one of those scales. So, if you started this one... You'd hope that your pupil would then play and this is a nice example of a question followed by the answer so here's the question and here's the answer so the last bit that we need to learn which we've already done before is this bit here three through the whole piece. It's actually not the hardest of um, minuets to memorise as long as you can see in a pattern where you are in the music. Have very definite places where you're playing. But if you practice it in different areas of the piece then that really helps. It means that you know it all over the piece rather than always going from the beginning. If you only ever practice from the beginning, the beginning will get good but the later part will not improve. So challenge yourself. One of the ways you can do that is have two dice and you just roll them and whatever number comes up, that's the bar that you're going to start on and you just have to play from that bar. It's a game which is quite useful. So uh, the last thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to play it to you once more but I'm not going to do the repeats, I'm just going to play it through. It's such a charming, elegant piece. It's absolutely gorgeous and it's part of another minuet which is in G minor so it has a kind of sibling that comes after it. They're a pair that go together and we're going to find that in book two so there's something to look forward to. So here we go, two, three. 